Okay, last but not least, concept four notes, we are going to talk about phylogeny. So first, before I get into phylogeny, I want to define taxonomy. This is a field of biology that classifies organisms. And we're going to get into this in a lot of detail in Unit 7, Ecology. But I need to mention it here because it comes up with phylogeny. Taxonomy organizes organisms by similar characteristics. And taxonomy currently, as I record this, has all life divided into three domains. There are eubacteria, which are your prokaryotes that or what you think of as like true bacteria, like pathogens, which are disease-causing bacteria. You have your RK bacteria, which are really, really unique category of prokaryotes that live in extreme environments. And then you have eukarya, which are all eukaryotic organisms. And then domains get further subdivided into kingdoms, phyla, uh, phyla classes, orders, families, genuses, and species. And this is an ongoing process, taxonomy is. It's constantly being adjusted as new evidence and information is found. Um, and for instance, now phylogeny is included in helping us classify organisms, which again, we'll get to phylogeny in a little bit. So this is a constantly evolving field. I shouldn't say evolving, changing, because I don't want you to have the wrong definition there. Um, the father of taxonomy is Carlos Linnaeus. Um, he is known for binomial nomenclature, which is a two-name naming system, which names organisms by their most specific name, their genus, and their species. So domain is the most general, and you get more and more specific as you go. So the more of these kind of categories you share with another species, the more closely related you are. So genus and species, think of that as your first and last name. And they're the most specific. Domain would be like acknowledging you as a human, you know, being, whereas genus would be your first name and species would be your last name type thing. So much more specific. These are always written in italics, this name, and genus is always capitalized and species isn't. So, for example, um, the American brown bear is Ursus um, arctos versus Ursus maritimus, which is the polar bear. Um, notice that the genus is the same, so they're really closely related, but the species is different, so they are considered unique species. Now, taxonomy is different from phylogeny, which it takes in consideration the evolutionary history of a species. So, a little background. Approximately 3.5 billion years ago, it is predicted that the first life form was a prokaryotic organism. Then, approximately 2.1 billion years ago, so a very long time later, it's believed that the first eukaryotes evolved through something called endosymbiosis. So essentially, one prokaryote ended up inside of another prokaryote, and both organisms thrived together. And so, endosymbiotic theory suggests that once they were inside each other, coevolution happened, and eventually led to speciation of the first eukaryotes. So... You're thinking, how could a prokaryote inside, end up inside of another? Well, for instance, one could have been like a parasite and the other a host, um, but then they ended up both thriving. And then the other could just be phagocytosis, where one basically ate the other, but it stayed alive inside and they thrived. And there's a lot of evidence for this theory, specifically when we look at um, organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts. Um, where they divide and they replicate in a way that's really similar to how bacteria do. Mitochondria have their own circular DNA like bacteria do. Um, their genes look really similar to that of prokaryotes, and they're also, they have double membranes like prokaryotes do. So that's kind of where this theory came up with for the first eukaryotes. And though, so because of that, I give you this very brief background, because from that, scientists believe that all organisms share common ancestry to this original prokaryote. And phylogeny is just looking at the evolutionary history and kind of trying to piece it together based on relatedness we see between shared inherited characteristics in organisms. So a phylogenetic tree is just a diagram that's predicting these evolutionary relationships and predicting this relate the relatedness between groups of organisms. In both taxonomy and phylogeny, again, are dealing with classifying and categorizing and grouping, and they're using a lot of the same evidence to do that. That's why I mentioned both in these notes. But the key distinction here is phylogeny, it's, it's a historical thing. We're looking at the evolutionary history and the evolutionary relatedness. 
So these trees show relatedness and branch points show new species diverging off from the common ancestor. And these trees are just hypotheses. They're totally just based on analyzing data of shared morphology. So structures like homologous structures and vestigial structures, looking at shared genes, looking at shared behaviors, that kind of thing. And when constructing phylogenetic trees, phylogenists try to be an evolutionary biologist, try to use the principle of maximum parsimony, which basically means we're going to make the simplest explanation possible for creating the tree. So these trees classify groups of organisms into major taxa, which is just groups, based on evolutionary relationships. And um, they classify groups of species in the order in which they descended from a common ancestor, again, looking for homologous features. So looking at shared heritable DNA, proteins, anatomical structures, etc., that could have been the result of divergent evolution to result in these homologous features. And I'm trying to show you different ways that these trees can look um, in terms of how they're organized. So here's a couple things when we're looking at these that we can learn. One, we can learn from an evolutionary standpoint which species are considered most closely related and which are considered least closely related. And then we can also see which species or group of organisms diverge first or longest to go. And then some of these phylogenetic trees will also have time scales, so we can also estimate when divergence happened as well. So how do we read them? Because that's what I really care about, is that you can read and interpret these diagrams, especially on standardized exams. These come up a lot. So first, when you're looking at these, always find the root. That is your common ancestor that all the organisms on the tree are predicted to have evolved from. So right here, this is my root right here. It's representing a common ancestor to A, B, C, D, E, and F. All of them have this common ancestor. As you're moving away from the root, you're moving forward in time. So down here would be past and up here would be more recent. Speciation is shown by the branching of a family tree. So every time we have a little node, a little branch here, something else is branching off. So we can see that A diverged first, and then as I keep going, then B diverged, and then C, and then D, and then E and F. Now, extinction is represented by the loss of a branch. So if a branch has this horizontal line right here, like I have pictured, that shows it being cut off um, and it no longer being in existence. And then each node represents a more recent common ancestor. So, like I said, down here, this, is, this node represents a common ancestor to everything on this tree. Up here, we have a common ancestor that C, D, E, and F share. Up here would be an even more recent common ancestor that D, E, and F share. So that's what we're looking at on these trees. Here's what's really, really, really important, how to not read them. These do not show that organ species A diverged into B, which diverged into C, which diverged into D. So for example, looking at this um, tree, bacteria, not all of these things were not bacteria, and then some became amoeba, amoeba, some turned into insects, some turned into trout, some turned into human and birds. That's not correct. They also do not show that A is greater than B, it's greater than C, greater than D. So just because you diverge last does not mean you're better. So humans are not greater than trout, which is not greater than insects, which is not greater, etc. They are trees. They are not ladders. Okay, so we're just looking at branching and we're looking at relatedness. So for example, let's look at this phylogenetic tree. And let's see from this, what can we predict? Remember, always start at your root. You can always see who branched off first would be persimmons. And then each node represents an even more recent common ancestor with humans and chimpanzees sharing the most recent common ancestor. So they would be the most closely related on this tree. These are the kinds of questions that we can answer on that. And I hope by practicing this in class, it'll make a little bit more sense. This is definitely one of those things that practice makes perfect. So we'll be sure to practice it a lot.